Well, good morning. My name is Robert Myers, and I'd like to welcome you um, to this presentation this morning. I'm the horticulturist here from Montpelier. Um, I'll kind of go slow just a minute so everybody can get uh, logged in and um, join the presentation. Um, but uh, just a couple of notes here. Uh, the presentation is not intended to be comprehensive or scholarly, uh, but we will look at some aspects um, of the landscape and uh, discuss their creation and how they've changed over the years. Uh, also, we will not go in a strict chronological order, uh, but we will skip around a little bit. Um, so I hope everyone can hear me and uh, I'll go ahead and share my uh, screen here. I do apologize for the lag time here while I do that. All right. Um, so again, uh, my name is Robert Myers, the horticulturist here at Montpelier. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to Montpelier's Horticultural History of Virtual Exploration. So one of the first questions um, probably to ask is, is why here? Why was this land chosen? Um, and one of the uh, key factors for that is the soil. Um, we have a very deep, well-drained, uh, moderately permeable soils, um, and they're very fertile. Uh, this was first observed by colonists around 1716 um, during the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe Expedition, which was led by Alexander Spotswood, um, royal governor of the Virginia colony. The land was densely forested in the 1700s, and, but may have contained um, abandoned fields uh, once cultivated by Native Americans. A member of that expedition was a man named James Taylor, and he was a land surveyor. Um, surveyors in that time recognized the quality of the soil based on the trees. So the uh, poplar trees in particular, which were very tall here, uh, were an indication of very rich soil. In this picture um, on the left is a tip up uh, where a tree is blown over and is exposing that rich red clay. And then of course we have uh, tulip poplars on the other side. Um, an interesting a uh, bit of history with that. James Taylor um, was James Madison's grandfather and also grandfather of Zachary Taylor, who was the 12th president. Uh, the Madison family acquired the land as a dowry uh, in 1723 when uh, Francis Taylor, um, well, they had married in 1721. Francis Taylor and Ambrose Madison were married in 1721. So that was uh, President Madison's grandmother. Um, Back to the soil, though, the uh, soil here is particularly uh, rich because it's Falkir and Davidson soils, which are considered some of the finest in Virginia. Uh, clay soil is more resistant to um, erosion than sandy soil, and also uh, it's able to attract and hold uh, positively, positively charged nutrients like calcium, magnesium, potassium, um, and it's a, got a good water holding capacity. So, that's sort of the basic code of the geology there. Um, we might wonder, you know, how do we know what the landscape looked like back then? Because this was, you know, in President Madison's lifetime, uh, photography was not yet available. Um, so unfortunately, we do not have very many records available. Uh, records were burned twice, um, Madison's personal papers. Uh, there are a few surviving examples, but as I said, records were lost twice in two separate fires. So we use what surviving uh, records we have along with archaeological excavation to interpret the Madison landscape, how it was used and what features were here. Uh, shown here is a dig in the south yard uh, just behind the house. Um, then some of the records we have include visitor accounts and then also records, something as simple as a uh, plant list. This list dates from 1791 and it shows uh, primarily vegetable seeds, but you'll notice at the bottom um, a packet of flower seeds was also included. And these were sent to James Madison Sr., President Madison's father. Um, so we use information like that. And then we also have another seed list that, uh, of course, this is a transcription um, that President Madison uh, wrote in 1809, and these are some cool season vegetables that he requested to be grown um, in the White House garden uh, for his use. And you can see things we still very much enjoy today, broccolis, cabbages, 
uh, radishes, uh, cauliflower, beets. Um, in addition to vegetables, we do know from visitor accounts uh, that a number of flowering plants were also included. Um, some are annuals and perennials such as um, roses, marigolds, gentian, and asters. Uh, we also know that they had spring flowering bulbs like daffodils, narcissus, tulips, peonies, and sweet william. Um, so those are some things you'll still find in the garden today. It does take some sleuthing to go through and figure out uh, what the plants are because sometimes common names have changed uh, profoundly or have been assigned to multiple plants. So we have to do a little detective work to determine exactly as best we can what they were talking about and then to find the seeds. Um, when you turn off of Route 20, what is today Route 20, and pass through the gates, you come through the woods as you approach Montpelier House. Um, the modern roads do not follow the uh, course of the original roads in Madison's lifetime, but the approach uh, coming through woodlands is very much the same, and we know that from visitor accounts. One man wrote about a visit in 1820, and this is from his letter, from the courthouse to Montpelier, after quitting the main road, you pass through a deep forest from which you emerge all at once to a view of the house and plantation. The effect is peculiarly striking and the sudden contrast creates both surprise and pleasure. And that was published in the National, uh, Daily National Intelligencer in August of 1820. And a little bit later in August of 1828, Margaret Bayard Smith uh, visited and wrote, after having lost ourselves in a mountain road which leads to a wild woody tract of ground and wandering for some time in Mr. Madison's domain, which seemed to us interminable, we at last reach his hospitable mansion. Another view of the woods there. Um, we'll jump ahead a little bit uh, as we go to the next slide here in a moment to give a little context. Uh, President James Madison died on June 28, 1836, and Dolly sold Montpelier in 1844 to Henry Moncure. He uh, held onto the property for a short period of time and sold it to an Englishman named Benjamin Thornton in 1848. We know that Mr. Thornton made a number of changes to the house and landscape before selling the plantation himself in 1854. The property would pass through five more owners before William and Annie DuPont took title uh, in January 1901. The DuPonts greatly expanded the house and planted extensively. Exotic trees and shrubs were added to the lawns and Annie DuPont worked tirelessly to replenish the formal horseshoe garden, which beginning in the 1880s had been first neglected and later completely abandoned. Though the DuPonts made many changes, they also documented the existing landscape. This map is from 1908 and uh, preserves in great detail a lot of the landscape features that were still uh, around when they acquired the property. So now we'll go back in time a little bit, back to 1797. That year, James and Dolly began adding on to his parents' 1760 brick home. Those additions created a duplex, um, which were, of course, two completely separate residences, but they were unified on the front by a classical portico. The additions were completed by 1800, and a little bit later, in 1809, work began again uh, to expand the house, adding the wings on the north and south sides. And that work was completed by 1812. <clears throat> around the same time, uh, in 18, around 1810, the garden was started, as well as the temple and its Pine Alley. The temple and Pine Alley replaced the blacksmith shop. And um, we'll look at some of those features in a little bit more detail. Here's a little bit closer up view of the map. And we're going to start with the front lawn. In 1804, Sir Augustus John Foster wrote, there are some very fine woods about Montpelier, but no pleasure grounds. Though Mr. Madison talks of someday laying out a space for an English park, he goes on to note some beautiful, um, sorry, Mr. Uh, Foster goes on to note some beautiful umbrella magnolias. And so we know that um, uh, ornamental plants were very much an important part of the landscape, although those particular trees are utilitarian as a bitter is made from the fruit of the umbrella magnolia. The English park um, is referring to the grounds of grand English country houses <clears throat> and the style typically um, we think of in the work of Capability Brown. Vast, gently undulating lawns with groves of trees and architectural follies are carefully designed to create the appearance of a natural landscape, though one that is very much idealized. 
And so we know that um, by 1816, Madison had accomplished this goal and he had, uh, the land around the house was laid out in an English garden with lawns stretching right up um, to the house itself. This picture, of course, is from the DuPont period, but does show a number of features uh, of the Madison landscape. <clears throat> the wide, excuse me, just a moment. The um, wide expanse of lawn, and then you can see on the left side of the picture some of the uh, pine trees that form the Pine Alley. And uh, we'll go ahead a little bit further, and here is the, the house, of course, today, with uh, the south yard on the right side. The uh, fencing is part of the modern uh, horse track, which would not have been here in Madison's lifetime, but still the wide open vistas um, would have been known to Madison. And here's a view um, from the front portico showing the magnificent Blue Ridge. And again, the, the sweeping vistas, beautiful landscape, just the natural beauty that is here. Um, in this picture, we can also see that, uh, of course, the front lawn is, is wide open. It's uh, very clear. You have a grand approach to the house. And you can see on the sides some trees, um, some spruces and firs uh, on both sides and also cedars. Some of these trees were planted by the DuPonts. There's a few that um, would have been pr probably planted by their predecessors. But again, the effect is clumps of trees, uh, clumps of shrubbery, and uh, again, wide open expanses of turf. Here's an example of the shrub, uh, shrub border. Um, Madison, it doesn't seem, had very many shrub borders. This is a DuPont era planting, uh, which is uh, still in existence. And this is right, ro located right at the road as you uh, come up the drive. And again, more of the clumps of trees. Here you can see a Canadian hemlock um, in the middle of the picture, and there's a spruce in the background, and then there's a buckeye on the right side of the picture. Um, the buckeye we know was here in 1789, as it was noted in the Madison family, not this particular tree, but a buckeye was here um, in the late 1700s, as it was noted in the Madison family's weather journal that it was planted in the southwest corner of the yard. This particular tree is actually located more in the northwest part of the yard. Um, we'll go back to the map for a moment. Uh, of course, the house um, is at the top, and then we're going to look at the area uh, over on the right-hand side where we have that 36-inch uh, catalpa circled in red. Um, and then you'll notice that just below that, there are a series of dots and the letter L, and those are all indicating locusts. So in this picture, also from the early DuPont period, um, you see the massive tulip poplar, and then the clump of trees in the center uh, looks to be silver poplar. And uh, these are remnants of trees that once would have screened off the South Yard. Uh, the South Yard is a collection of dependency buildings um, where domestic slaves worked and, and lived and uh, took care of the many, many daily chores that had to be done to run such a large house during the Madison family's ownership of the property. So we'll go forward a little bit and this is the um, reconstructed South Yard um, from this spring and the purpose of these trees, uh, you can see here the purple flowering is a uh, black locust, this is a pul purple flowering cultivar called purple rogue, and then the trees without flowers more in the center are um, what we know as, as honey locust, but botanically they're also thorny locust. And these trees, there would have been a few more of them during the Madison ownership of the property. The purpose of this was to screen off the uh, south yard from the approach to the house so that these buildings, though necessary, um, wouldn't be a focal point as visitors drove, uh, not drove, but uh, approached the house. So these trees were planted um, in 2019 uh, to recreate the grove that once screened off uh, the south yard. And uh, the catalpa seen here, this was uh, in the early 1900s. The two children are um, Marion, the taller child is Marion DuPont, and then her younger brother, William. Uh, the catalpa we know <coughs> stood in the south yard before those buildings were demolished. And those buildings were demolished long before the DuPonts bought the property. So again, this picture is from probably around 1905 um, and shows 
the uh, still living catalpa, though somewhat deteriorated with age, and then you can see in the background uh, the expanded house as the DuPonts had added on to it. Um, next, we'll take a look at our uh, English oak, and this is a Madison era planting, um, still doing very well. You can see um, in the picture on the right, you know, the trunk is quite uh, gnarly and, and um, very, very thick. It's, it's an impressive specimen, very beautiful. And this is uh, just south of the reconstructed south yard and then just outside the garden wall. You can see that in the background of the, of the picture on the right. Um, English oaks are a um, of course native to Europe and England, um, so it was an exotic species and we're not sure the exact date that this tree was planted here, but it, it would have been introduced. Um, English oaks are also a member of the white oak group, and so they're utilitarian. Uh, trees that are in the white oak group produce acorns that are lower in tannins and therefore are more palatable than oaks in the red oak group. Uh, those acorns can be used for uh, feeding animals and can also, uh, in times of past, have been ground into flour for human consumption. And <clears throat> now we're going to take a look at the Pine Alley, which this picture, of course, uh, shows the house after the DuPonts made their um, additions. And you can see on the left hand side, the very tall pines. Those are uh, the original pines from uh, Madison's Pine Alley, which led from the house to the temple. A little bit further out view, this is of course the picture we saw a little bit ago, and you can see more of those pines. And you can see a ghostly image of the temple in the very far right hand corner. And then this uh, shows the, the forced perspective. The Pine Alley tapered as it curved and went slightly down from the house and created an effect that it was a larger expanse than, than otherwise it would be. And um, this shows the replanted Pine Alley. These trees were planted last uh, fall um, after extensive archaeological work to determine their exact location. Originally there would have been 12 trees in uh, the Pine Alley, uh, but we've as there's still going to be further archaeological uh, digs in that area, we've only planted half of them. And another view uh, looking from the temple up towards the house. Uh, just down from the temple <clears throat> is what we know as the Walnut Grove. Um, Many people have remarked about the beauty of the Walnut Grove over the years. It's just, like I said, just down, the house, just down from the house and the temple, um, and also contains part of the area we know as Dolly's Midden. Uh, before um, we move on a little bit, we'll go back to another detail of the 1908 map. And this is actually looking at the, the uh, back lawn of the, of the, behind the house. And you can see there the cops, um, noted here, it, essentially a big shrub border, and it's still there. It contains um, Kentucky coffee trees, um, dogwoods, lilacs, um, ornamental shrubs that predominantly date uh, to, the, to the DuPont period. We know that in the time of James Madison Sr., the rear lawn was largely utilitarian, uh, but uh, President Madison decided to improve upon it. The lawn originally uh, was more of a hilltop and through uh, extensive manual labor by the enslaved workers of Montpelier, the lawn was leveled and created a uh, expansive entertaining space. Um, and here's a quote uh, from Mary Cutts, who was a niece of the Madisons. Um, Mr. Madison was fond of horticulture and had many fine specimens on the lawn, among them Pride of China with its odoriferous and beautiful uh, lilac blossoms the Osage Orange, and all the forest trees at its boundaries. So we know that space was very important um, for entertaining here and also for aesthetics. And there's a current picture of the back lawn showing the Kentucky toffee, coffee trees there, um, are the tallest trees in the center left of the photograph. And in the back, uh, you'll see some boxwood and, and other uh, shrubs. Most of those shrubs are all DuPont era. 
And here's a picture from the early 1900s, again, showing um, young Marion and William DuPont Jr. with that same area in the background. And again, another view uh, as you come out a little bit further away, uh, showing the dogwoods and then um, black walnuts. And the effect there is that this essentially screened off the walnut grove. At one time, it probably would have been a, a clearer view uh, down into the walnut grove and into the uh, land beyond. And here we have a picture looking across, um, looking west across the back lawn. And um, you'll see this beautiful walnut tree, which is a Madison air specimen, taking up the center of the, of the frame. Um, and that references a, a quote um, from President Madison's lifetime, that the back lawn stretched um, across and behind the house was another portico. And from this, you step down into an extensive lawn bounded by a ha-ha. And so here is the ha-ha today. Um, this was in the spring uh, with some spring bulbs coming up and it's uh, easier to see at this time of year. So essentially a ha-ha is a landscape feature that, that creates a barrier between um, animals and it keeps animals from entering spaces you don't want them to uh, by creating an invisible from the upper side, from the lawn side, uh, you don't really notice that it's there, but from the um, ha-ha side, it creates a, a barrier so that animals do not come up and enter the, the back lawn. You essentially keep uh, the animals contained without having to have a fence or um, visual obstruction. So visitors would have looked across the lawn and then over top of the ha-ha and into the wooded pasture beyond. And uh, again, on the left, a picture of William and um, Marion when they were very young, showing the ha-ha and then uh, the massive tulip poplars that still stand. We think that these trees could be the ones President Madison referred to as his twins, which were two massive tulip poplars uh, that stood across the lawn um, and just in the edge of what is now the landmark forest. Uh, these trees are ancient and, and quite large, uh, but both are uh, hollow, so it's a little difficult to date them. Um, a, a big feature of the landscape here for many, many years was the Cedar of Lebanon. Uh, there's some pictures here. The, of course, the upper left-hand picture is from the early 1900s and shows um, <clears throat> the tree in excellent shape, still quite uh, vigorous. And then um, the photograph on the top right is a little bit, uh, probably about 10 years old um, when the tree was still in fairly good shape and it was actually taken from inside the garden. And then the picture uh, on the bottom left shows it in the last, uh, I think, spring of its life. Unfortunately, the tree uh, succumbed to fungal disease and had to be removed last year. Tradition holds that this tree was gifted to the Madisons by the Marquis de Lafayette in 1824. Um, and again, as I said, it did succumb to fungal disease uh, last year and was removed for safety's sake. Uh, well, next we'll move on into the garden. Um, this picture was actually taken from the Cedar of Lebanon and, and in this you can see the edge of the back lawn and then the brick wall and uh, ornate gate uh, that were all built by the DuPonts. Um, many people since the garden was created in about 1810 um, have remarked about the splendor of it. Uh, again a quote from Mary Cutts, uh, it was a paradise of roses and other flowers to say nothing of the strawberries and vegetables. Every rare plant and fruit was set out, was sent to him by his admiring friends. Um, in the time that uh, the Madisons owned the property and, and used the garden, it did contain a number of um, ornamental plants, you know, flowering plants, uh, but it was primarily used for the production of fruits and vegetables. Uh, the garden today is about 2.4 acres, and it's uh, this is from the 1908 map, but this is still accurate to the uh, shape of the garden. Um, it's thought that the garden once extended into the back lawn a little bit further and had a, a horseshoe upper on, on the north end, same curve that would match the horseshoe terraces in the middle of the garden. Um, this quote is from 1871. 
Um, no alteration has been made in the garden except to, curta to curtail it on the upper or lawn side, which was originally circular, but now has a boundary parallel to the line of the lower end. That was published in Lippincourt's magazine again in 1871. So this is a picture of the garden um, from around 1905 after uh, extensively being renovated by the DuPonts. Um, again, earlier I mentioned that the uh, garden had been largely neglected and then abandoned beginning in the 1880s, so much so that once the DuPonts bought the property, it was described as a wilderness of weeds and broken boxwood. Um, so we'll mention the boxwood here for just a moment. Uh, boxwood had been a staple of European horticulture for centuries. Um, the boxwood are not mentioned in any writings known uh, from the lifetime of President Madison. It's possible that they were just too ubiquitous to garner any attention because they were so, you know, commonly used. Um, it's also possible that records mentioning them have long since been lost or that there were no boxwood here at all. What we do know um, is that Benjamin Thornton, who owned Montpelier from 1848 to 1854, is credited with planting the boxwood grotto out front of, uh, on the front lawn. And, but we also know that there were some very large boxwood mentioned in the 1800s. In 1863, a letter written by Benjamin Justice noted huge box bushes in front of the house. And a New York Times um, article published in 1881 noted that the boxwood in the center alley shown in this photograph um, were about eight feet tall. And then you can see that the boxwood on the upper part of the garden, um, particularly on the left side, are huge. Those boxwood are around 12 to 14 feet tall. Boxwood grow quite slowly, so it's very possible that these boxwood date from late in Madison's lifetime. And here you can see, um, again, those same giant boxwood, and then also you can see the lion statuary, and again, uh, Marion and, and uh, Willie DuPont. Um, the DuPonts added all of the statuary that's seen in the garden, um, including these beloved lions. The lions are copies of um, Antonia Canova's bronze originals that guard the tomb of Pope Clement XIII at St. Peter's Basilica. Again, this is the stone sink, uh, also added by the DuPonts. This is located in the very bottom of the garden, and we still plant this uh, with annuals. Um, where are there are eight uh, urns in total on the east and west sides of the um, of the garden, four on each side. Um, this particular style of urn, there are six of those, and then the other uh, two. And there's a set of two that match each other. Again, we still use these containers um, every summer. And we cap them in the winter time because of the uh, potential for freezing and, and cracking the marble. Um, in the top of the garden during the DuPont period, uh, visitors would walk through the gate and then come into uh, this garden house, which was uh, constructed of wood and, and Adirondacken style and matches the existing or the, the still present um, fencing in the garden located on the slope as you get to the very lowest level. And you can also see uh, the long bench uh, just beside the gatehouse and then the uh, topiary an extensive uh, it's hard to make out in this photograph but uh, these are largely planted with roses uh, the beds in the foreground and again um, you can see a little bit better in this picture uh, on the left hand side you can see some of the uh, rose bushes that Annie DuPont had planted and the garden house is, is still there, but completely grown over in that picture on the left hand side. And then there's a picture as you come through the gate of the interior of that structure, looking down, uh, looking south towards the bottom of the garden. Uh, today in the top of the garden, we are bringing Mr. Madison back into the, into the garden. So on the north um, west side of the garden, this border has been emptied of perennials and flowering plants and we have been including Madison era vegetables in it. This picture was taken in the spring and the bright yellow flower, flowers you see in the foreground are mustards and kales. Um, such plants were very very common in uh, European horticulture at the time and also as a carryover to uh, the United States 
in, in the early 1800s and well, well before that. Uh, so we've incorporated vegetables that would have been known to Madison or specifically requested by him in that list in 1809. Uh, some of the other plants in this picture include broad beans, which are in the very, very foreground. And then in the far end, next to the gate, um, you can see the leaves of the artichoke. Again, here in the top of the garden, going back into the DuPont period, you can see uh, the many rose bushes um, that Annie had cultivated and some of the topiary in the background. Uh, the DuPonts planted a number of topiary. Um, you can see the sort of a wedding cake design in the very far back. Um, there were others that were shaped uh, like animals or um, statuary. Um, again, all in boxwood um, and really quite beautiful. As, as I was saying before, the uh, top of the garden we're bringing the Madisons back in. And so in addition to the vegetables, um, these parterres, which were put in in the 1930s when uh, Marion DuPont took out her mother's roses um, in, in the planting arrangement that they were in at that time, um, these parterres were put in in about 1935. They were designed by Charles Gillette and um, uh, at that time contained roses for, for Marion. We have planted them with herbs that would have been known uh, in Madison's lifetime. So this side, uh, the east side, contains medicinal herbs, and then the corresponding parterre on the west side of the garden contains culinary herbs. And here we have a picture of the center of the garden, um, probably from the 1920s or 30s. Um, this was on the west side of the Allee, and you can see that the DuPonts had it uh, bedded out extensively. Um, it would be easier to see the, the design of the parterres from above, but uh, this gives you an idea of the beautiful um, planting scheme that they would go, uh, that they would implement. Um, you can see some geraniums and, and other summer annuals in the very foreground. You can see the bird on nest, uh, boxwood topiary on the left side. And then again, uh, more edging boxwood, um, another topiary in the center, and some various perennials filling out. Uh, so providing a lot of color uh, as you would experience the garden, and I'm sure a lot of perfume as well. And this is the uh, a little bit earlier view um, in the center of the garden. This is a, looking from the east side north towards the house. And again, you can see the bird on nest topiary in the very center. It gives you a little bit better idea of the quartering that was done in the flats. And we know this was fairly early because the uh, boxwood hedge in the center is still a little thin in spots. Um, one of the first things that was done when the DuPonts took over the garden uh, was to restore the, the hedge by pruning it back um, and bringing it to where it uh, wasn't completely blocking the path. In addition to um, adding the statue where you can see in this picture, the stone stairs, sort of in the center of the photograph. Uh, in Madison's lifetime, the garden uh, ramp that went down the center of the garden was earthen and um, would cover with grass. The DuPonts brought in um, the pea gravel and the garden tile and also the stone stairs uh, to make a little bit um, smoother uh, trek. And here's a little bit later view showing the um, this probably hand-colored <laughs> uh, photograph. You can again see the bird on this topiary. And this is just before uh, the time when the garden was simplified a little bit. Um, you can see that, that a lot of the elaborate uh, planting is, is gone as far as the um, uh, parterre there in the middle. The edging boxwood that we saw a few slides back is gone. And it looks like it's mostly just turf, although this is um, taken in the early spring and there would probably be more summer annuals planted very soon. Um, a little bit later, Marion, acting on the advice of Charles Gillette, who had designed, uh, redesigned the top of the garden, quietened the garden down and removed all of the plantings in the middle of the garden. Um, the bird on nest topiaries were retained for many, many years, but were eventually allowed to grow up into uh, just large shrubs. And so if you see the boxwood on the left side of this picture, that was the uh, 
topiary before, and that's the, the way it looks now. Um, the crescent beds, uh, of course, are still there, as you can see in this picture. Um, this was taken in August. And we'll uh, go back in time again. Um, this is from the early 1900s and shows um, the top of the that same crescent bed. And you can see it looks like some plume poppy um, and some types of uh, perhaps flocks in there. So the DuPonts had uh, many perennials um, in the crescents. And today, those crescents um, form the showpiece, I guess, of the, as, as a good way to say it, of the center of the garden. Um, today they are planted with the perennials favored uh, during Marion's lifetime, iris and peony and daylily. Uh, this picture was taken um, in August, so most of those uh, beautiful summer perennials had uh, passed or, or, or not, not started yet, but uh, we'll go through them a little bit more seasonally. Uh, so here's an example of uh, some of the iris blooming this spring, and you can see the peonies there uh, just getting ready to break bud. Um, so here's some of those uh, peonies in flower. Uh, wonderful perfume in the garden in the spring, um, early summer when the peonies are, are blooming. And then, um, of course, we have the daylilies, and you can see some summer annuals as well uh, for added color. And again, we do know that uh, during the Madison period that, that uh, annual seeds such as marigold uh, were sown for summer color. So uh, flowers have long been a part of the garden um, in addition to, as I said before, in Madison's lifetime, it was primarily um, used for the production of fruits and vegetables and, um, and herbs, of course. Uh, we know Madison that uh, the Madisons uh, grew figs here. We also know that they uh, highly uh, anticipated the uh, first cherries of the season every year and also um, peas. I should have mentioned that a little bit further uh, back when we talked about the vegetables. So um, next we'll look at the landmark forest. Um, we know that this land was cultivated during the lifetime um, of James Madison's uh, father and grandfather. Uh, somewhere around 1800 it is thought that this part of the plantation um, was not cultivated anymore in the sense of being plowed and planted, but was instead uh, given over to grazing and timber harvesting. Uh, that pattern of land use continued into the early 1900s. Um, in 1930 and 31, uh, employees of the DuPonts harvested uh, the blight-stricken American chestnut and presumably a number of other uh, tree species at that time and that was the last time that logging took place on that part of the property. Um, Marion DuPont Scott at that time instituted a policy of complete protection for the landmark forest and in 1987 it was officially given protection and recognition as a national natural landmark. Uh, so there's um, of course the stone monument there and there's a viewing platform just uh, the side of that uh, to the side of that, excuse me, and there's about a mile and a half of trails in the landmark forest today, and it's uh, again fully protected as a as a natural space. So, if you haven't ever had the uh, opportunity to come out and walk the trails, I certainly invite you to, and, and hope you will be able to in the near future. Um, and here's a group of, of folks enjoying a hike and a talk in the landmark forest. Um, this. A uh, group of people includes master naturalists, Virginia master naturalists who uh, do volunteer uh, work in the woods and also uh, provide hikes and educational talks um, throughout the year. And that's it for uh, that part of uh, the presentation. So I'm going to unshare my screen here. And um, if you have questions or, or um, you know, something you'd like me to expand on a little bit, uh, please go ahead and send those through and I'll answer them as best as I can. Oh, 
Oh, I'll um, try to think of something else here to, <laughs> uh, to, to share while we wait and see if there's any questions or, or comments. Um, the property is open uh, to visitors um, from Thursday through Tuesday. Uh, from We open at 9 and, and close at 4. So if you um, have the time to come out and visit, I uh, would love to see you. Uh, there are all walk walking tours available uh, of the property. And also a private uh, tour of the house can be scheduled in advance. So again, we would love to see you out to visit um, here at Montpelier. And I'm usually in the garden. And so I'd be glad to answer questions um, if you have any about the landscape. Well, I think we have no questions, so I'll go ahead and end this. And thank you all for watching this morning.